Praise the Lord and good evening. We do greet you in that wonderful, matchless name, Lord Jesus Christ. And we do thank the Lord for another week that he has kept us, protected and provided for us, and allowed us to come together in fellowship in his word one more time. Welcome to our midweek encouragement where we look to just take a few moments to share something with you from the word of the Lord in hopes to be an encouragement in the midst of your week. Tonight, I'd like to look at a passage of scripture found in the New Testament in the epistle of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 8. And just speak to you tonight from the subject matter, Departure Time is Still on Schedule. Thessalonica, in the first century, was the capital of Macedonia and its largest city. It was strategically situated on the Vaegnatia, the great Roman highway to the east. Under the direction of the Holy Spirit, the Lord used the Apostle Paul to establish a church in Thessalonica on his second missionary journey. And due to some very destructive opposition in Thessalonica, Paul and Silas departed Thessalonica and went to Berea. Some months later, Paul wrote, to the young church at Thessalonica from Corinth or Athens because he had the saints in Thessalonica on his mind and in his heart. He kept them in prayer daily as he received constant reports on the trials and tribulations they were enduring. So with great concern and compassion, since he was unable to visit them himself, Paul sent his son in the gospel, Timothy, from Athens so that he could get an up-close and personal look at the condition of the church and strengthen the believers in their trials and status by direct encouragement. When Timothy had completed his time at Thessalonica, he brought back a good report to Paul, saying, the church, in spite of all the difficulties they have faced, have not denounced their faith. Timothy also told Paul that there is some confusion in the hearts and minds of the believers there. Timothy explained to Paul that the saints have two major concerns. The first was they were living with the expectation that Jesus would return in their lifetime. Some of the church members had already passed, and in the meantime, the church was troubled because they began to wonder what happens to the dead. Were their hopes for a life in Christ in vain? Some of the church members were worried about the dead because they feared they would not participate in the parousia, the catching away of the church, or the rapture of the church. It is possible they were influenced by the Sadducees who did not believe in the resurrection of the dead. And the second concern was that some of the saints were so overwhelmed by the thought of the imminent return of the Lord that they neglected their work, their jobs, their daily lives and responsibilities just to wait for his coming. So Paul wrote the first epistle to the Thessalonians to address these concerns. And Timothy brought this letter to Thessalonica so that all the church members could hear it read. With the love and care that the apostle Paul felt for the new converts, he could not help but write this letter. Therefore, Paul answered the worried church with this. The living and the dead saints will be united with the returning Christ. The first epistle to the Thessalonians is a letter of expectation. It is soaked 
with our glorious expectation to be saved from the wrath of God and then to be with him for eternity. When reading what the Apostle Paul wrote in 2 Thessalonians, I think it is evident what the Thessalonians were most likely um, troubled about, or should I say, it's easy to possibly see that they were likely incited by or even deceived by false teachers, which brought about an incorrect understanding of the words of the first epistle. And there were two passages of the first epistle in particular that it seemed the enemy tried to confuse this church about. One was found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 15, which reads, For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. And the second area of truth that was attacked is found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 2. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. The concerns for this young church in Thessalonica were the day of judgment and the sudden return of the Lord. They were led to conclude that the day was at hand. And this had produced great confusion in the church. To correct this mistake, the Apostle Paul sent them this second letter in which he shows that this day must be still in the distant future because there are prophesied events that must take place before the Lord Jesus Christ comes for his church. Paul explains to them that the day of the Lord refers to the wrath of God upon sinful man. The question arises then, when will the Lord pour out his wrath? The scriptures tell us that this will not occur until the apostate church brings forth a great falling away. The apostate church is spoken of in Revelation. She is called the great whore in Revelation chapter 17 verse 1. And it is this apostate church that will help the Antichrist, or if you prefer, the son of perdition, in his rise to world power. The Bible speaks about the Antichrist when he achieves great power. He will come into an allegiance, agreement, or covenant with Israel to restore the temple and the old form of temple worship. The Bible also tells us that in the middle of this seven-year agreement, the Antichrist will break the agreement and commit what is called the abomination of desolation and will declare himself to be God, as recorded in Daniel chapter 7, verse 25, and also Revelations chapter 3, verses 4 through 8. After this event, the abomination of desolation, and Israel rejects him as being God and Savior, the time of Jacob's trouble will begin, what we call the last three and a half years of the tribulation. But before all of these things can come to pass, the true church, not the apostate church, but the true church must be taken out of this world so that it will not endure the wrath of God. Then Paul goes on to say that the Antichrist cannot be revealed until the restraining force, which is the church, is removed. The working of the Holy Spirit through the saints. When the saints are removed through the rapture, then Satan through the Antichrist can institute his program this will be the beginning of the seven-year tribulation. These are events which are still to come. But for now, many are wondering how much longer must we suffer in this present world? 
How much longer must we, what must we strive to hang in there? How long do I or we have to wait? The basic definition of wait is to remain or rest in expectation. To remain or be in readiness. In waiting, our patience can be tested. I believe that waiting can affect individuals in such a way that their character will be revealed. There are many who have no patience to wait for anything. They want everything done now or yesterday. And there are those who are so patient until they almost forget that they are waiting. A basic example, uh, when making a phone call to a business or a company and they place you on hold. Now, years ago, uh, when you were placed on hold, there was nothing but silence until someone came back and took you off hold. Uh, then silence was eventually replaced with music for the holding party to listen to in an attempt to keep them calm and distracted. Now, the extremely patient may become so involved in enjoying the music that they may forget about how long they've been on hold, whereas the impatient individual may hang up as soon as they're put on hold. Now, this is just a basic example. In life, there are many things right now that people are waiting on that is testing their patience. Many things. For some, um, some waiting for a husband. For others, waiting for a wife. Some looking and hoping and waiting for a financial windfall. While yet others looking to the Lord for healing and so on. And as they wait, their, their patience is tested and their character is being revealed. I encourage you this evening to wait patiently as you are about your father's business because while looking for the rapture of the church, because the Lord will not change the departure date, hour, or second. This day, hour, and second were set even before Adam and Eve were created. So despite all that is in the headlines today and grabbing everyone's attention, I believe some of it is creating a spiritual distraction. Rather than us looking up and remembering that our redemption draweth nigh, we're glued to the television, the internet, the radio, and disturbed by what's happening in our world. But I want to remind you tonight, these things were prophesied that they would come, but we are to look up. Please remember that patience helps us keep our confidence in the promises the Lord has made. We read of how the Lord brought to pass all that he promised in the Old Testament. And he will bring to pass all that he has promised in the New Testament. He will return. He will reign. And when he returns in the midair to receive his bride, the church, that scheduled day, minute, second, will not be altered. For the church departure time is still on schedule. It behooves us to be ready. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage. And he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Because departure time is still on schedule. Until we meet again. Shalom.